All right, hi everybody. Today I'm gonna to take you through the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. We're gonna take a look at each of those components individually, specifically the aggregate demand curve, the short run aggregate supply curve, and the long run aggregate supply curve. We're gonna look at what influences the slope of each of these curves, um, what can shift them, and what goes into informing the placement of each of the curves in the first place. And then we'll talk about what some of the gaps look like. Um, and you will learn why, why there are gaps or what kind of gaps can exist in this model. So first, let's take a look at aggregate demand. All right. So the aggregate demand curve, as you're going to see on this tab, is this blue curve that is downward sloping. It slopes downward because of at least three effects that pertain to the factors that tell us what aggregate demand is. So even before we talk about what the slope is, let's talk about what those factors are that inform aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is the total demand from four sectors of the economy. Those are personal consumption from households, gross private investment from firms, government purchases from government, and net exports, which is the value of all the goods and services, final goods and services we export outside of the economy, minus all the goods and services we import into the economy. So all of that comes together to give us what would be the final amount of output demanded for the economy at any given price level which is what information is contained here in this aggregate demand schedule that you can see in columns A and B, right? Aggregate demand schedule includes two things. It includes the price level and the quantity of output that would be demanded at that price level. Now, the price level one is the baseline price level. That means that if prices do not change at all between the current year or a current period and whatever period you're looking at with this model, then we have an estimate for what demand would be or the amount, the aggregate amount of demand in the economy would be. As the price level increases, if it increases 1%, we have an estimate for what that aggregate demand would be with that 1% increase. If it increases by 10%, we have an estimate for that. If it increases by up to 20%, we have an estimate for that as well. What you'll probably first be noticing is that as the price level goes up, we see aggregate demand decline, right? This is similar to what you see happen with the demand curve. And the reason why the demand curve declines or the reason why the demand schedule for a demand curve gets smaller as the price increases is because of the law of demand, right? In the aggregate demand, decreases as the price level increases for different reasons. Those reasons pertain to those four factors we've just brought up. So the first reason is the wealth effect, where higher price levels make real wealth less valuable because more of the spending power of that wealth would go towards inflation or paying the cost of inflation versus the actual value of another good or service. So if you, for example, have a stock of wealth, either in stocks or maybe you have it in household equity in the fact, or I should say in housing equity, or maybe you have it in gold bars that you have stuffed under your bed. However you would hold this wealth, that wealth becomes less valuable to you as prices in the rest of the economy increase. And that is why we assume that as the price level goes up, we would see less demand. Or in the reverse, as the price level goes down, we would see more demand. The other reason is the interest rate effect. Um, the short version of this is that interest rates tend to follow the direction of price levels. So if the price level goes up, we expect interest rates in the economy to go up as well, which should be a disincentive to spending, both for firms and for households, and also for government, honestly. And that disincentive would create less aggregate demand. So that as the price level increases, we should expect aggregate demand to decrease as well. The final reason is the international trade effect, which basically suggests that 
as an economy's price level increases, the value of goods and services in that economy, they become more expensive compared to an economy where similar price increases have not occurred. So that it is a disincentive to people who are outside of the original economy from purchasing goods or services from there. So as prices go up in our economy, you should see less people exporting or you should see less people trying to purchase goods from us because that higher price level is a disincentive to purchasing goods and services. All three of those effects are major reasons why the aggregate demand curve slopes down as the price level decreases, or I should say is negatively correlated to the price level. So that as the price level decreases, we see larger amounts of output demanded. And as the price level increases, we see less output demanded. Now, there are a couple of things that could potentially play with this curve. I would like to get into the short run aggregate supply curve first, though, before I talk about either any of those things, because it will involve an understanding of movements that apply to both of these curves. So next is the short run aggregate supply curve. For output in the economy, right, we want to not only just consider the demand side, but also the supply side. And the supply side has a similar relationship with the price level as the supply curve does in the, de in the demand and supply model. Um, in this case, right, as the price level goes up, you see that the quantity of output supplied by producers increases. Um, that is because higher price levels should theoretically be an incentive to producers to make more output in the economy, at least in the short run. And that is what's critical about the supply side is that the impact or whether or not price levels have an impact and therefore what level of output will exist in the economy differs between what we expect in the near term versus what we would expect from the long run or the trend for the economy. So in the short term, in the short run, with the short run aggregate supply curve, we see a positive relationship with the price level. Whereas the price level increases, we see the amount of output supplied by producers increasing as well. If you really want to understand the intricacies of why this works, we can go to this aggregate supply upward slope tab and the basic breakdown here is that if you're producing a good or service, you're basically dealing with managing two things, your marginal benefits and your marginal costs. Your marginal benefits are roughly equal to whatever the price is of the good or service that you're producing, and your marginal cost is made up of a whole bunch of other costs, including some that are fixed in the short run. In the short run, we assume that wages on one of those fixed costs. And therefore, as the price level increases in the rest of the economy, right, it may increase the sale price per unit because that is subject to inflation in the short run, which means the marginal benefit per unit will increase in the short run, but marginal costs will not increase as much, if at all, in the short run. So you see that there's a modest increase in marginal cost compared to marginal benefit, and that is largely because we assume that in the short run, the wages earned for employees are going to be largely fixed because of things like union contracts that exist in some industries, but also because of the expectation that employees usually have that their income will not dramatically vary down with downside or upside risk. So to some extent, year-to-year -year changes cannot be accompanied by year-to-year -year directional changes in the wages of individual employees. Um, with that in mind, then, your marginal costs are really heavily controlled because labor is a large part of the cost for a lot of goods and services. But on top of that, you can sometimes see fixed capital costs which aren't uncommon because entrepreneurs often try to find capital at a controlled price so that they can plan in the long term. 
And you may see similar situations with natural resources, although that's not always the case. In either case, what happens is that there is a gap between marginal benefit and marginal cost as prices go up in the economy. So producers see an incentive to expand their output. Why not expand output if I could reasonably make more money by incurring more marginal costs? Because yes, I have yet, I have yet to actually maximize the efficiency of, of my output. If my output was efficiently maximized, then marginal cost and marginal benefit would always equal each other. But as inflation changes that dynamic and makes marginal benefit exceed marginal cost, entrepreneurs make the decision to expand their level of output. And since they can't change too many of the other factors available to them in the short run, what they end up doing is changing the level of employment in the economy. They decide to employ more workers to produce more goods and services. That leads to a situation where in the short run, as the price level goes up, as inflation increases, we see higher levels of output as producers employ more workers so that they can take advantage of the difference between the fixed costs of production, largely wages, and the flexible prices in the market that are going up with inflation. So this is, this is the backbone of the sticky prices theory that distinguishes the short run aggregate supply curve from what we'd expect in the long run or the trend for the economy, right? So that's the final component of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model is this long run aggregate supply curve, which as you see here on the schedule is a single number on the x-axis, right? It's a single point on the x-axis no matter what the price level is. And that is because the things that determine the long run trend for the economy, the um, long run aggregate supply schedule are independent of the price level. And that is because the long run aggregate supply schedule, I'm sorry, the long run aggregate supply curve is assumed to be the same as what we estimate for the potential output for the economy. The potential output for the economy at this point you should just understand that it is directly connected to the labor market, right? So, for example, if our economy theoretically achieves an equilibrium labor market, an equilibrium labor market would be where the amount of people who want work equals the amount of people willing to hire or the amount of jobs that are offered in the economy. So let's say at a real wage, and remember we're talking about real wages, so that's independent of prices. At a real wage of $25, 157 million jobs are out there and 157 million people are willing to work at that real wage. That would be what we would consider the natural level of employment for the economy because the labor market would be in balance and that balance is 157 million people who are working for $25 an hour in real wages. Now we assume that, that 157 million people produce a certain level of output. And we can see what the level of output would be by looking at an aggregate production function curve for the economy. So we will get into more about what components go into the um, determination of output in the long run. But let's assume for our economy that the only thing that can really change is the level of employment. So things like capital and technology are always gonna be the same regardless of anything else. In that case, at 157 million people employed per year, we expect the real output for the economy to be $18.9 trillion. And that in fact would then become the long run aggregate supply curve because we assume that the long run is the potential output for the economy. And that's why you see that regardless of the price level, because again, we're talking about real wages, regardless of the price level, the level of output that we would expect in the long run, the trend for the economy would always be around $18.9 trillion. Now you understand the three components here in the curve, right? In the, in the model, we're talking about aggregate demand, aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply. And we are talking about 
I'm sorry, aggregate demand, the short run aggregate supply, and the long run aggregate supply. And we're talking about them in relation to the price level. So graphically, we represent this with a downward sloping blue aggregate demand curve, an upward sloping red short run aggregate supply curve. The colors don't matter, but in this case, I just want to identify for you what colors you're looking at. The short run aggregate supply curve is a red upward sloping curve. And in this case, a vertical yellow long run aggregate supply curve that just comes out of a single point on the x-axis. The y and x-axis are each labeled price level for the y-axis, and the x-axis is real GDP in 2012 dollars. So this could also, the real GDP on the x-axis could also be replaced technically with the idea of output, right? Real output for the economy. So what we're looking at with the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model is a relationship between the price level and the anticipated output for the economy, depending on where these curves ha are in relation to the long run aggregate supply curve or where they are in relation to the trend for the economy. So how do these curves shift, right? Because as we know, with the demand and supply model movements, along the curves are they're caused by changes in prices and similarly for the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model movements along either one of the curves are triggered by changes in the price level so if the price level is the only thing that is changing then we would expect the levels of output to be different right they may not be at equilibrium so if for some reason prices increase 6%, if nothing changes about where these curves are, there's gonna be an imbalance between how much supply is demanded, or I should say how much output is demanded in the entire economy versus how much output is supplied in the entire economy. So it's really, it's really easier to understand what actually ends up happening by understanding what shifts these curves, because rarely is there ever just a change in price that isn't accompanied by some sort of shift in these curves. Um, this isn't a model of a single market, so there isn't really, there isn't really a variable out there or something out there that would just only for some reason impact inflation, but wouldn't impact the real circumstances in the economy. I mean, it could exist theoretically, but you will very rarely find a circumstance that matches that. So we should really talk about what could cause shifts in these curves. The aggregate demand curve is informed by those four components we discussed before, personal consumption, gross private investment, government purchases, and net exports. So if any one of those things change, and I'm moving over to the control panel now to show you what type of things those are, if any one of those things change, if we change government purchases, for example, right, then we can cause a shift in the aggregate demand curve. We'll get into what crowding in and crowding out is in later videos, but let's just say that we, for example, had decided to drop two trillion in spending in government purchases. Two trillion additional dollars in spending government purchase in the economy. First thing, right? Anything that changes one of the aggregate demand curves components doesn't make a one to one change in the total level of output that would, the total shift that would happen in the aggregate demand curve, the shift in the amount of output demanded, right? The change goes through what we call a multiplier. And you can see the multiplier in cell G64. The multiplier for government purchases in this case is 1.25. So any change of 2,000 or 2 trillion in this case would go through a multiplier to be a change of 1.25 times 2 trillion. So the difference between the two components, so we see this 2 trillion difference here, it gets multiplied by the 1.25 and you end up with 7 point nearly eight trillion dollars for the final component for real GDP. So instead of real GDP only expanding by two trillion, you end up with real GDP expanding by nearly um we have almost like four to uh 
report almost $5 trillion in additional spending and government purchases. So what does that do to the aggregate demand curve? Let's see where it's shifted. Okay. So already we can see that the aggregate demand curve has shifted dramatically to the other side of the long run aggregate supply curve. If I was to undo the two trillion that we just added, it was at first at intersection, right? They both intersected over effectively where the long run aggregate supply curve is. If I re-add in the impacts, you can see that there is a dramatic shift in the curves and specifically a very dramatic shift in aggregate demand. By shifting aggregate demand, we have changed the equilibrium price level for the economy. The equilibrium price level at first was at one, now it's probably somewhere closer to 1.1, um, a little bit below 1.1. So the new price level is probably somewhere between 1.1 and 1.5. If we go to this tab that will allow us to change the price level. Okay, so it's actually a price level closer to about 1.05 that gets us the new equilibrium for the economy. And what you can see now is that what we have is a situation where the economy has, due to a change in government purchases, had a shifting. Um, both the short run and the aggregate demand curve, the, or I should say both the short run and aggregate supply curve, and the aggregate demand curve shifted out because the type of government spending that we did in the simulation um, incentivized private interests to also spend, which we'll learn more about in later, uh, in later videos. But for these, this purpose, what you should appreciate now is that the change in government purchases has created a inflationary gap. It is an inflationary gap because not, okay, well, first it's an inflationary gap because what we have is a situation where the economy now is in equilibrium with around $21.2 trillion of output, right? And you can see that it kind of makes sense that if we're somewhere close to 1.5, we should see we should be somewhere in this range here. And what we see for the economy's output is that, yes, if we go to the control panel, that the final output for the economy is $21.2 trillion. So at, with $21.2 trillion of output, we have pushed the economy beyond its long run potential. Remember the long run potential at this point, if we check on what's going on with the long run aggregate supply curve, the long run potential for the economy is 17.5 trillion. So with an inflationary gap, now the economy is overperforming. And the concern with that overperformance is that it, it, it won't be sustainable. If the trend is closer to 18 trillion, then 21 or 22 trillion dollars of output won't be sustainable in the long run. So to some extent, there is a need for correction, or there will be some correction that happens. This correction could happen in one of two ways. The economy could either naturally correct itself in the sense that this 4.92% inflation may, in the short run, be unexpected by firms. It will create a level of output, or will create a level of disequilibrium in the labor market, right? So in the labor market, what we end up seeing is that in the short run, the demand for labor is 164 million people, even though that isn't necessarily sustainable. But what is happening is that there is a need for more demand to meet the level of output that is being requested in an inflationary environment but with 5% increases in some um, goods and services in the economy, there will, in the long run, be a demand from laborers that their wages meet this new price level, right? Even if the price level doesn't go anywhere further for the rest of the year, at some point, either in the second year, maybe in the fifth year, if price levels still are just where they are today, there's going to be some demand from workers that like, hey, prices went up 5% several years ago. We need our wages to go up too. That increase in wages 
would probably bring the aggregate supply curve back towards equilibrium. So actually, if we were to even try to simulate what would happen, right, if um, this level of inflation didn't eat away at the real wages for laborers. So if we were to just go over here and say, okay, instead of the real wages being at 23, let's say the real wages are back to their $25 mark, in which case there would be some equilibrium in the market, but what you're gonna see is that this aggregate supply curve now shifts, right? And the aggregate supply curve has shifted over to the left. And the shifting to the left means that it is contracting a bit. And if we just continued that process, right, if wages just kept on going up, what you would see is that there'd be a growing level of disequilibrium unless prices change. And what would happen with prices is that they probably end up having to go up to accommodate the shifting of just the, aggregate, uh, of the, just the short run aggregate supply curve. So these things can correct themselves naturally in, pr in the price of labor, just like going back to what it should be in real terms in the long run. But you could also, for example, have government not spend the $2 trillion or even do something else more drastic, like perhaps, I shouldn't say more drastic, do something else along the lines of monetary policy, such as increasing the um, rate for federal funds. So if the federal funds rate increased from 2.16% to let's say 4%, what you'd see happen in the economy is that these curves start shifting out dramatically. They start to, they, they start to contract. You see that the shore and aggregate supply curve is contracting in such a way that its intersection with the aggregate demand curve would be at far less output. If we were to really try to find out where the new price level would be, the new price level would probably be somewhere in the negatives. So maybe 4% is too much. Maybe if we had just done 3% for the increase for the new levels. Yeah, so even for 3%, right, you can see that the increase in the federal funds rate has created a situation where the new intersection for the curves would probably be somewhere in the negatives as far as the price level and definitely at a lower level of output. So if we were to even try to figure out what this level, this new level of output would be, let me do that real quick. Okay, so if we actually went with a price level of point nine three one that kind of gets us back to equilibrium so what you see is that that would imply that if the fiscal authorities if congress if government purchases went up by two trillion dollars and the fed was really concerned that that was going to create a big inflationary gap they could try to create contractionary policy right so that two trillion dollars would count as expansionary policy. It was the government purchases expanding the economy. Um, that would be maybe appropriate during a recessionary gap where the level of output was below the long run aggregate supply curve or to the left of it, but in a environment where we are on potential or even exceeding potential that may create some level of inflationary gap the Federal Reserve could counteract that inflationary gap with contractionary monetary policy, like raising interest rates. All of these things we will learn more about in later videos. And what you can see is that by raising those interest rates in hand with the expansionary policy, price levels actually dropped by almost 7%. And the real level of output now is $17.1 trillion. So you can use these tools either active intervention policies like contractionary policies or expansionary policies to adjust where the economy is performing relative to the long run aggregate supply curve. And the point of that is that if the economy is underperforming, you can use expansionary policies like increasing government purchases to bring the economy back to its long run potential. If the economy is overperforming, you can use contractionary tools like increased interest rates, 
from monetary policy to bring the economy back towards its potential. All these things imply that there's some level of control that we have over the economy that we should probably use if we think that the natural corrections will take a long time or cause a disproportionate amount of suffering. So hopefully this demo has helped you understand a little bit more about how the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model works in modeling where output for the economy should be and what the level of inflation or deflation may be to accompany that level of output based on various components that go into the model, such as components of demand and the components of supply in the economy.